Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Anand Parikh. I'm the Chief Medical Advisor here at the Bipartisan Policy Center, and I want to welcome all of you to our event this morning. Today, uh, BPC is releasing its report, Ending HIV in America, Policy and Program Insights from Local Health Agencies and Healthcare Providers. As you know, in his 2019 State of the Union Address, the President announced a new federal commitment to end the HIV epidemic in the United States within 10 years. Today, there are an estimated 1.1 million Americans living with HIV, with just under 40,000 new cases each year. While there are many federal efforts underway to enhance prevention, early detection, as well as treatment, BPCC sought in this project to understand the state of the epidemic from the front lines. The specific goals of this project were number one, to highlight new and emerging trends in the domestic HIV epidemic, with a focus on underreported epidemics in the South, the Midwest, and among particular risk groups. And number two, to provide illustrative policy, financing, and public health program challenges and opportunities facing health departments, health systems, and community-based providers. This morning, we'll first hear about the methodology and key findings from BPC's study. This will be followed by keynote remarks from leadership at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services on federal efforts to end the HIV epidemic. And finally, we'll hear from an expert panel consisting of frontline practitioners and HIV policy <laughs> experts. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. This event is being, strive, uh, is being streamed live via webcast. Thanks to everybody joining us via webcast. And we'll have an opportunity for audience Q&A following the keynote remarks, as well as the panel discussion. So just look out for the roaming mics on either side of the room. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. Charles Holmes, consultant to BPC on this project, who will start by briefly summarizing BPC's study findings. Dr. Holmes is a visiting associate professor in the Department of Medicine in the School of Medicine and the faculty co-director for the Center for Global Health Practice and Impact at Georgetown University Medical Center. Dr. Holmes is an infectious disease specialist and is internationally recognized for his technical policy and programmatic contributions to combating HIV and infectious diseases. During the Obama and Bush administrations, he led efforts on behalf of PEPFAR, serving as Chief Medical Officer and Deputy U.S. Global AIDS Coordinator to expand access to HIV treatment and broader health services and improve the effectiveness, resource allocation, and accountability of U.S. government investments. Charles, thank you for being here today. Well, thanks very much, Anand, and uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you for being here and for being on uh, the webcast. I'd like to thank um, uh, Naomi Seiler, who was a great partner on this work, as well as the entire Bipartisan Policy Center team, um, and I hope you really enjoy spending some time with this report, which brings the front lines um, of the ep uh, epidemic fight, um, hopefully, to uh, those of us here in Washington. HIV, as you know, was first recognized in the early 1980s in the U.S., and it was a virus that caused a disease for which there was no treatment at the time. It subsequently cost over 700,000 Americans their lives. The U.S. response was driven by extraordinary advocacy, but primarily by those affected by the disease and ultimately by a bipartisan uh, set of actions that was undertaken by the federal government in order uh, to take into consideration the needs of individuals as well as the power of science uh, to mount a sustained medical and public health response to HIV. U.S. investments in basic and clinical uh, science by the NIH and streamlined regulatory pathways have led to extraordinary advances in, uh, since those early dark days. There are over 50 medicines and combinations of medicines used to treat HIV at this time, giving people the opportunity with HIV be living with HIV, the opportunity to live full lives, and also giving us a new armamentarium with which to prevent the disease. The Ryan White Care Act, of course, enacted in 1990 and led by HRSA, has been the centerpiece of the federal government's efforts uh, to support care and treatment for individuals living with HIV. The Affordable Care Act in 2010 led to expanded insurance coverage, and the White House Office of National AIDS Policy launched the first national AIDS strategy that same year, which had cohesive targets for the uh, HIV programs nationally. 
It should be noted that U.S. successes in fighting HIV uh, in many ways inspired the uh, international uh, and robust uh, U.S. leadership in fighting HIV globally in the form of PEPFAR as well as U.S. contributions to the Global Fund. However, as our report makes clear, we still have a long way to go from a public health perspective. As reported by the CDC, nearly 40,000 uh, individuals were infected in the U.S. Uh, with HIV in the last year, and 6,000 individuals died due to the disease. Many of the people living with HIV are among the most vulnerable in our society and have the least resources to protect themselves and to deal with the consequences of HIV. <clears throat> and although HIV was initially considered an epidemic of the coasts, we detail in the report the patterns of infection have shifted over the last decade. Now over 50% of new diagnoses are taking place in the south and 23% of those diagnoses are taking place in suburban and rural areas. The epidemic was further exacerbated, of course, by the opioid epidemic domestically, and uh, also tracked along with increases in hepatitis C virus. Men who have sex with men, or MSM, are currently at greatest risk for HIV infection, and young black and Latino MSM have the highest overall rates of HIV infection in the US. These risks are worsened by late or undiagnosed HIV in these communities, coupled with racism, of course, stigma, and well-documented barriers to healthcare access, all of which facilitate HIV transmission and acquisition. Our report highlights insights gleaned from structured interviews with providers of HIV prevention and care services, as well as uh, local health departments in each of the eight jurisdictions that uh, we interviewed. The jurisdictions themselves were chosen for, with an eye towards balance, uh, of epidemic size, political leadership, Medicaid expansion status, and other factors. The, um, the jurisdictions included rural uh, epidemics, such as those in Scott County, Indiana, coastal urban jurisdictions, such as the Bronx and Seattle, as well as Midwestern uh, jurisdictions, Kansas City, and Clark County, Nevada, uh, including Las Vegas to the west and southern sites including Jacksonville, Florida, Richmond, Virginia, and Montgomery, Alabama. We reviewed uh, in detail, as you'll see in the report, uh, the epidemiology and state of the response in each of the jurisdictions and ultimately try to provide a glimpse into the challenges and opportunities for uh, federal, state, and local uh, action to improve the effectiveness of the public health response. Four of the eight jurisdictions are among the administration's 48 and the epidemic counties, and two are in the seven rural states that were chosen uh, for the new plan. A few top line uh, findings that I want to uh, just reference include um, the importance, first and foremost, of the Ryan White Care Act, which continues to provide critical support for people who are uninsured and which can include a considerable portion of low-income people living with HIV infection. In those states with higher rates of insurance coverage, uh, the program still often fills gaps in insurance and fills and supports people living with HIV to keep them healthy and connected to the healthcare system through case management and multidisciplinary services. We heard time and time again throughout uh, our conversations and review of the literature uh, of the importance of the program. The program, the Ryan White program, works so well indeed that people from across jurisdictions spoke to us about the need for similar programs that could provide support for people who are HIV negative but who are highly vulnerable to the infection. For these individuals, mental health and substance use treatment, along with outpatient prevention services that enable access to pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP and other interventions that include housing, uh, were thought to play a potential key role in reducing HIV risk, averting HIV infection, and ultimately reducing the human and economic costs of new HIV infections. It was noted that further expansion of PrEP to the over 1 million people who are considered eligible in the U.S. Uh, will require attention to expanding the pools of providers who feel comfortable prescribing it, building from successful pilots of novel approaches such as phone-based prescribing in uh, high-risk areas and addressing issues of cost. 
Access to care in rural areas was considered a critical challenge, as we'll hear about more um, from Mike Murphy and others this morning. Um, stigma, family rejection, especially amongst uh, LGBTQ teens, lack of transportation and trained providers were noted as key gaps and opportunities, along with the need for resources for evidence-based solutions such as telehealth. We also report on the critical role of intense care coordination and partnerships that are required particularly for prevention of mother-child transmission. Often between, these partnerships are often between the public health system as well as key academic medical centers uh, in, in each of the jurisdictions that are equipped to provide the intensive perinatal care to these women uh, living with HIV and their babies. Actions that have enabled the U.S. to reduce new infant infections to less than 100 per year However, we also heard concerns about the challenges of providing consistent support to pregnant women who have many other issues, including unstable housing, substance abuse, and limited educational uh, attainment, issues that lead to concerning pockets every year of mother-to-child transmission, even here in the U.S. We heard of cracks in the public health infrastructure and the need for investments in the capacity of state and local health departments to use disease surveillance to better outreach to those most in need. And importantly, the need to reverse system-wide losses in, in key personnel in many uh, state and local health departments. <clears throat> we heard about the need for expanded housing, as I referenced earlier, for those that are living with HIV, and a consensus, both in the literature and in our conversations with interviewees on the need to address social determinants of health. I just want to provide one snippet um, from the report from a health department official who, when asked what could make the federal uh, HIV initiative more responsive to the needs that they were seeing on the front line, said, to have funding that's flexible enough that it allows us to address what people often call social determinants of health. A lot of our funding is around providing PrEP, condoms, STI screening and treatment, but we can also support folks in getting employment, getting housing, and all the other structural factors that we know drive HIV infection in our community if people go without them. The report is rich uh, with quotes, data, and hopefully insights that bring the experiences uh, from the front lines of the response back to those trying to better understand it and to better shape policies. You'll get to hear firsthand from two of those that we interviewed uh, uh, on our panel, as well as other experts, um, and uh, I look forward to that conversation. With that, I'll turn things back to you, Anand, and uh, to introduce our keynote speaker. Charles, thank you for the summary of the report, and once again, for everyone in the room, hope you picked up a copy of, of today's report. Those of you watching via webcast, the report is now available at bipartisanpolicy.org, uh, so please, uh, uh, please take a look uh, today. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for the morning, Dr. Tammy Beckham. Dr. Beckham is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Vaccines and Infectious Diseases in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. In her current role at HHS, she leads the Office of Infectious Diseases and HIV AIDS Policy, whose mission is to provide strategic leadership and management while encouraging collaboration, coordination, and innovation among federal agencies and stakeholders to reduce the burden of infectious diseases. On behalf of the HHS Assistant Secretary for Health, Dr. Beckham is providing operational direction and oversight for the President's Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative, a plan for America. She also oversees the execution of national strategies for HIV, viral hepatitis, sexually transmitted diseases, and vaccines in response to the highest priorities of the Secretary and the Assistant Secretary. Prior to joining HHS, Dr. Beckham worked with the Cooperative Biological Engagement Program at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency in Fort Belvoir, Virginia. From 2015 to 2017, Dr. Beckham served as a dean of the College of Veterinary Medicine at Kansas State University. And from 2010 to 2015, she was a director of the Institute for Infectious Animal Diseases at Texas A&M University System. Her previous roles include Deputy Director for Science at the Department of Homeland Security and Captain in the United States Army. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tammy Beckham. I'm 
Thank you, Anand. And it's such a pleasure to be with you today and have the opportunity to talk a little bit about um, the initiative and ongoing activities um, with the initiative. And so I'm here representing the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health and the Assistant Secretary, Dr. Brett Jawar, and the administration. And I'd like to just give you a little bit of an overview on the initiative and ongoing activities within the initiative. I think it's important, um, first let me commend you on the report uh, that came out today. A very robust report taking a look at the uh, diversity of jurisdictions across the U.S. and providing some very um, uh, sound recommendations for the challenges that we're going to face and uh, noteworthy, as you mentioned, uh, the changing epidemic today as opposed to even a decade ago and the things that we're going to have to address and the challenges that we face uh, within looking at the, the epidemic in the context of today. So I'm going to move forward, um, hopefully, maybe, maybe not. Slides? We have slides? And if not, I will just chat. Ah, oh, there we go. I'm not sure where I pushed that to, but okay. Um, there, oh, there we go. Now we got it. So um, as mentioned previously, um, HIV has really cost America too much for too long. Uh, we know that we've lost over 700,000 lives to HIV since 1981, and if we don't do anything from this point forward over the next decade, we could lose up to 400,000 additional lives. So while we've made tremendous progress that has previously been mentioned, um, we have plateaued with the number of diagnoses on an annual basis, and this graph really shows that. To somewhere around over the last um, five, six, seven years, around 38,000, 40,000 new diagnoses every year. And so if we do nothing, um, that is where we can expect to stay, or we can expect for that to grow over the next decade as well. And so why is the time right? Why is now the time to address this epidemic? Well, we have the right data, we have the right tools, and we have the right leadership. So as you know, in February, the President Trump announced this bold initiative to end the HIV epidemic in America. Um, the Secretary, the Assistant Secretary, we have leaders from SAMHSA, NIH, HRSA, CDC, OASH, everybody across the board is working very closely together um, now in the, as part of this ending the HIV epidemic. We have the epidemiology you heard that talked about earlier. We know where new infections are occurring. We know where new diagnoses are occurring. We have the appropriate medications now, the antiretroviral therapy as well. We have PrEP. We'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges around PrEP, but we have methods for preventing new infections as well. And we have no models of care, but I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges around those models of care and what we need to do within the context of the epidemic that we're facing today. So when the administration was asking the question, and, uh, and Dr. Redfield and Admiral Jawar um, sat around the table with the secretary, they were talking about what does the epidemic look like today, and why are we still seeing this plateau of 40,000 new diagnoses um, and new infections every year? Well, if you take a look at this map, you can see that over 2016 and 2017, over 50% of new diagnoses occurred in just 48 counties, seven states that have substantial rural burden, D.C. and San Juan. So really taking a look at the epidemic epidemic today and what that looks like, if we focus in these areas, what are the things that we can do to ensure that we can take this 40,000 down to the bold, goal of what, bold goals of what we have with the epidemic over the next decade, which is to reduce it down to 3,000 um, annually. So taking a look at the geographic distribution, we also know that we face um, some real challenges with demographics as well. So as you heard previously, um, we, right now new diagnoses, 43% of new HIV diagnoses are in African Americans, but they account for only 13% of the population. So we're seeing um, some real uh, focus areas that we need to focus on um, as you take a look at across those 38,000 new diagnoses. As you heard earlier, uh, men who have sex with men have the greatest risk. Uh, young black, teen, black Latinos are also at, at high risk. So we have some disproportionate affected populations, um, not only by geography, but also by demographics and ethnicities as well. So the other thing that we know as you take a look at the epidemic of today, nearly seven in 10 people have seen a healthcare provider in the 12 months previous to their diagnosis and they were failed to be diagnosed. So that is a failure. That is a failure. One in two people with HIV have the virus at least three years before their diagnoses. And we know that if we're going to end the epidemic today, we have to do better than that. So what is causing that delay? What are the issues? What are the challenges around that? 
Also, if you take a look at, like I said, we have therapies. We have the therapies today as opposed to the 1990s. Today, it's much simpler. There are many options. You can take one pill a day, very few side effects. And in fact, as mentioned with the Ryan White program, um, in the Ryan White program, we have about 86% viral suppression. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. And that's due to the, the new therapy. So if you take a look um, at HIV treatment preventions and new infections, we also know that Undetectable viral loads means basically there's effectively no risk of transmitting that virus. Undetectable equals untransmittable. So with these new tools, with the antiretroviral therapies that we have, with undetectable equals untransmittable, and knowing that if you can get to an undetectable viral load, you're effectively no risk of transmitting the virus, then again, we have the tools today to end this epidemic. Another tool that we have in our arsenal is PrEP. We know that we have about 1.1 million um, individuals out there who are at risk, but of those, we probably have less than 20% currently taking advantage of PrEP. Some of the barriers around PrEP have to do with stigma, attitudes, um, lack of awareness, lack of education around it, and just barriers to linkage to PrEP care and prescribing PrEP. And you heard previously um, people were talking about, this, uh, talking about the successes of the Ryan White program and being able to maybe leverage some of those successes in Ryan White program around prevention as well. So we can talk about that in a minute too. So our program will also work closely um, with HRSA and uh, catalyzing the successes and building off of the successes of the Ryan White program. So as I mentioned, um, and as you know already, Ryan White pro program has been tremendously successful, and I think we heard that in the report and the interviews that you did at the local level, and that 86% of those clients were virally suppressed that are in the right Ryan White program. So what we want to do is make sure that we're taking advantage of the successes of the Ryan White program, and under this initiative, we'll be expanding the Ryan White services so that we can treat newly diagnosed most HIV patients. So I'll talk a little bit about the initiative in a minute and um, what that means for moving people into Ryan White, et cetera. So another part of the initiative that's going to be critical is, is really taking advantage of the community health centers and making sure that we utilize the community health centers to their fullest extent, using these health centers as primary sites for expanding PrEP and uh, access to PrEP and expanding the capabilities of the health centers to provide HIV pre prevention and treatment. So um, another key initiative of part of the initiative is the NIH, the CFARS, and making sure that um, their implementation science and their capabilities are brought to the forefront. So we know, again, in the context of the epidemic today, if we were doing the same things we were doing a decade ago, uh, we also know that, that it may not work. And we also know that if the things that we were doing were working, we wouldn't continue to have that plateau of 40,000 new diagnoses each year. So what we have to do within the initiative as we really have to take advantage of implementation science and new models of care, um, and we have to look at ways of reaching patients that might be more difficult to reach through the healthcare system, and maybe not even through the healthcare system, but meeting these patients where, we, where they are. And NIH, looking at unique models of care, working with CDC and HRSA are going to be critical to that and critical to our success in the initiative. So I've been talking about the initiative, but what is the initiative? And so the initiative is basically in five years, we want to have a 75% reduction in new HIV diagnoses, and in, nine, in 10 years, a 90% reduction of new HIV infections. And you can see the principal uh, primary uh, agencies that we have up here, CDC, IHS, NIH, HRSA, SAMHSA, all of those are playing a very key role, working very closely together in a very collaborative manner to make sure we get off the ground running with the initiative. We're building the initiative around four pillars, diagnose, treat, prevent, and respond. We know that we have to diagnose individuals with HIV as quickly as possible. We know we ha once they're diagnosed, we have to link them to care and get them virally suppressed, so that's treat. We know we have to prevent. As I mentioned, we have about 1.1 patients that, sh that, are, that are high risk for HIV. We need to reach those patients and make sure that we move that 20% number way up and have patients that need to access PrEP have access to PrEP and the services around PrEP. We know that we need to respond to new HIV clusters and address them rapidly so that we can um, get out and control that before they begin to expand. And the one thing that I don't have up here, but is also going to be really critical, is workforce development. We cannot sustain this initiative without building the workforce. And for us, that means getting out in the community and working with the communities to do that and build the workforce. We want people living with HIV, people who have walked 
in that life to be part of that workforce moving forward because they will help us sustain the progress that we will make and they are the ones that can reach the patient. So we need to be working not only through our state and local health departments, but also through our community-based organizations. And that's gonna be absolutely critical. One of the things I wanted to just briefly talk about in the initiative and just give everybody an update on is uh, we asked for dollars in the 2020 budget, and as you know, you've seen the budgets and where they are, but I want to talk about what we're doing in 19, because we didn't want to wait till 20 to get started. So we've really hit the ground running, and using minority HIV AIDS funds from the Assistant Secretary's office, we have been able to fund the planning uh, for jurisdictional plans so they can develop their community plans to end the HIV in their jurisdictions. Um, those plans are due to CDC and IHS by December the 31st. We've also been working very closely with CDC and funded some jumpstart sites. We funded Baltimore City, East Baton Rouge, and DeKalb County and jumpstart sites so we could take lessons learned from those areas and we could then apply them in 2020. Um, we also funded the Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma as well. There's been a ton of activity in, in 19 um, helping us lay the groundwork for where we're going to go in 20. We're also in the process of uh, awarding a data analysis and visualization system which would basically be a dashboard board to track jurisdictional uh, progress as well. So um, I also want to just quickly move through um, just a couple more slides. Uh, Presidential Advisory Committee Council on HIV AIDS, you guys know the importance of this. Um, we took Pacha to the people in Jackson, Mississippi in July and we'll be doing the same thing coming up in Miami. Um, and then we've had a really robust listening session and tours and this just shows you where we've been and the, and the jurisdictions that we've visited so far and the opportunities for us to listen to the community from the community because this is going to be very much a community-based effort and just some of the things we're hearing and I'm going to quickly wrap up um, at some of the things that came out in the report access to care innovation is going to be needed it's not going to be the same type of health care we're going to have to meet people where they are stigma we have to address stigma we have to coordination of care linkage to care social determinants huge factor housing is public health transportation is public health we have to address those issues to be successful in this initiative uh, workforce people living with HIV we need to grow the workforce with people who have walked the walk and lived that life and we need to have those people to be able to help us be successful in this initiative so we're very excited about the initiative we're making a lot of progress um, and I'm happy to stop now and answer any questions because they're back there going like this so happy to do that but I'm um, just excited about all the things that are happening I want to thank you for the report the crosswalk on the jurisdictions um, tremendous uh, recommendations that come forth and um, aligns closely with what we've been hearing out in our community listening sessions as well. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? I think I got five minutes. When I initially came in, they told me I only had five minutes to talk and ten minutes of questions. I almost had a stroke. <laughs> so, um, so I got five minutes of questions with you guys if you have some questions. Yes. Uh, Sarah Lipsy from Atlas Research. Um, would you talk a little bit about what data tools you're using to um, find and highlight the HIV clusters you discussed? So we work closely with CDC, as you know, um, as far as data and working with the jurisdiction. So CDC works closely with the state and local health departments, and in doing so, that's where a lot of their data comes from. But again, working very closely with state and local health departments. Aquarius. Good morning, Dr. Beckham Aquarius Gilmer with the Southern AIDS Coalition. You talked about um, the um, challenges around barriers around PrEP. Mm -hmm. um, how are we going to, and what are your thoughts around uh, provider accountability mm -hmm. in terms of um, prescribing or not prescribing PrEP, mm -hmm. um, biases? Mm -hmm. What are the sort of the, uh, the trajectory of keeping providers accountable, particularly those who are federally funded? Right. So I think we have to do a better job of educating and making sure providers are aware and have the educational tools in their background to understand PrEP and um, around the accountability issue. I think obviously that is uh, something we'll ha we have to, to look at. I mean, I think the best way to get there is to educate, make them aware, um, try to reduce the stigma, work with them. Medical education is a good place to go to start some of those conversations as well, and really get out and have more communications and education with our providers to help them understand the importance of, of PrEP with ending the epidemic. Yes. Hi, John Hassel, AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Hi, John Hassel, AIDS Healthcare Foundation. 
Um, it's been reported that the CDC is a patent holder for uh, TDF, the, the, the medication and PrEP. Um, is there any plan for the CDC to get some of the money from those, from those patents to help pay for the cost of PrEP? Um, I know that's kind of a controversial issue. I also want to note the first sentence in this report says Gilead paid for this report. And I'll, maybe at some point we can ask the authors of this report whether that presented any ethical uh, compromises in its, in its examination of this issue. Thank you. So I'm not here today to talk about the patent issue, but I, what I will tell you is that HHS did secure a donation from Gilead um, to provide PrEP for up to 200,000 individuals a year for up to 10 years um, through 2030. So we are in the process right now of looking at, uh, under that donation agreement, HHS is responsible for distribution of that PrEP, and we're in the process of uh, working to implement that donation, and hopefully this fall we'll be able to roll that donation out and be able to reach more individuals who need access to PrEP. Hi, Mahir Khan with the Peace Corps Office of Global Health and HIV. You mentioned uh, there's an increase in diagnostic complacency um, in general in HIV messaging. How do we overcome that? I think we have to have uh, more automated HIV testing. Uh, it's got to be uh, an opt-out uh, instead of an opt-in. And so those are some of the ways that we can address it and really routinize HIV testing within emergency rooms and other areas, STI clinics, et cetera. And some of those um, some of those activities are really already being addressed in some of the pilots as well. So some of those activities are really in some of the jumpstart areas, and we're really going to be able to take those lessons learned uh, and hopefully move those forward in, in 2020 with the other jurisdictions that will come on during phase one. Hi, I'm Anna Forbes with the American Academy of HIV Medicine. Uh, I notice in the um, uh, first page of the report that under um, uh, targeted programming efforts, we talk about uh, young men who have sex with men, maternal and uh, maternal health, perinatal, et cetera. Uh, I don't see women as women identified anywhere in here, and I wonder if that is uh, deliberate or if that is just a matter of not paying attention to the fact that women are people in their own right in addition to their maternal uh, Rule. Are you talking about the report itself? Yes. I'll have to let them answer to the report. So, other questions? Yes, yes, ma'am. Hi, good morning. I'm Dr. Blocker. I'm a Ryan White HIV Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Dr. Blocker. I'm a Ryan White um, Commissioner. Do you have a strategic plan in place on how you plan to reach clients who need prep? <coughs> who need prep? So we're, um, as, as I mentioned, we are in the process of uh, looking at implementing the donation for PrEP. So that's just one aspect of it. How do you distribute the drug and how do you get it out? But the other aspect of that is education and awareness. So how are we going to reach the populations? Um, what are the tools that we're going to use? And so, yes, we are absolutely in the process of establishing that educational and awareness program to have a very robust campaign around PrEP. I'm working with both providers, um, stakeholders, community groups, community-based organizations. It has to be very jurisdictional focused, we believe, because every jurisdiction is going to be different and the methods and the messaging that we use in those jurisdictions are going to be different. So we'll be working very closely with the jurisdictions to help identify what that messaging is and what the best way of reaching those individuals within their jurisdictions will be whether that's through social media, whether that's through other forms of uh, or other different types of media. We'll, we'll be taking a look at how, how we do that, and we'll be working really closely with the jurisdictions to do that. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Last question. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Beckham, for the important work you're, you're leading at HHS, and we're looking forward to continued signs of progress in the months and years to come. Uh, and there were a few questions uh, that were brought up uh, during the Q&A, and I think we'll be able to get to some of those questions uh, during our expert panel discussion. Other questions that we uh, aren't able to get to, we'll certainly uh, can take on uh, at the end of, of today's session. So at this time, we'd like to shift to our expert panel discussion, focusing on today's report. The moderator of today's discussion will be Naomi Seiler. Ms. Seiler is an associate professor in the Department of Health Policy and Management at George Washington University 
where her research centers on the intersection of the evolving healthcare system with public health priorities. Her portfolio currently includes leading a team policy, uh, providing policy support to DC's HIV, AIDS, hepatitis, STD, and TB administration. She previously worked in Congress as counsel to Representative Henry Waxman and also served as lead House staffer on the reauthorization of the Ryan White Care Act. At this time, I'd like to ask Naomi, as well as our four expert panelists, to please join us on stage. Thank you. So thank you so much, Anand, for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. Um, I'm really excited to be able to engage in a conversation with these amazing experts. Uh, as was noted before, uh, two of the folks up here were interviewees for the project, so you'll be able to hear some of their perspectives today, as well as read about some of their um, experience, that where they work in the report. But what I would like to do, rather than kind of read you a list of introductions, is first take a moment to allow each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and their organizations, um, so that you can start to think about what questions you might like to ask in the Q&A, having a bit of a sense of their background and context. So we'll start with Greg. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Greg Millett. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Is it the mic on? Turkey? Okay, great. Uh, Greg Millett. I'm uh, Vice President of the of AMFAR, Foundation for AIDS Research, and head of the DC office that's responsible for federal policy. Uh, prior to AMFAR, I was in the Obama administration um, in the Office of National AIDS Policy, um, one of the individuals who worked on the National HIV AIDS Strategy. And prior to that, I was with CDC for 10 years as a scientist. Great. Michael? Hi, I'm Michael Murphy. I'm uh, Executive Officer for Medical Advocacy and Outreach. And as you can probably tell, I'm not from New England. I'm actually from Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, I'm your resident country boy that's up on the stage today, so that's good. I represent. Uh, but we are serving an area of 28 counties and some of the poorest uh, counties in the state and then in the country, actually. So I'm really excited about this. I'm also excited about the interest in really addressing rural issues because, as you'll find out as we talk today, uh, HIV in rural America is very evident and it's strong, and we've got to address it. So thank you all. My name is Phyllis Mann. I'm Capital Area Health Network in Richmond, Virginia. Um, we are FQHC. Um, serving the HIV population. Hey, good morning. I'm Gretchen Weiss. I'm the director of the HIV, STI, and viral hepatitis program at NHO, which is the National Association of County and City Health Officials. We represent the 3,000 local health departments across the country and really work to improve the, the health of communities by strengthening and advocating for these local health departments. So really appreciate the opportunity to be on the panel today and for the work of the Bipartisan Policy Center to undertake this effort from the perspective of the, the local level. Thank you. So I think what we have here is an opportunity to delve into some concrete ways that federal, state, and local policymakers can address the problems identified in the report. And like many reports, there's a, a lot of spaces given to identifying problems, explaining problems, giving the local perspective on how things play out. And there are considerations for policymakers at the end, which we encourage everyone to read, but would love to hear um, a little more on the ground perspective from all of you about some of those concrete ideas. So to start off with something easy, I want to start with eliminating stigma. Um, and you know, we heard a little bit already from um, Dr. Uh, Beckham about the role of HIV related stigma, about U equals U as a really important sort of scientific and messaging tool, right, for to, to reduce stigma related to HIV specifically. But the folks we spoke to in interviews for this project, that was, you know, stigma directly related to HIV is not the only issue, right? You have racism, you have sexism, you have homophobia, you have transphobia, you have anti-immigrant sentiment. So there are a whole bunch of intersecting <laughs> stigmas um, contributing to people's risk creating barriers to care, to testing. Uh, wanted to see if you all could talk a little bit from your own perspectives, both about how you see stigma concretely play out. We all agree stigma's bad, but what do you, why exactly is it bad? And concretely, what do you think are the policies and programs needed to address it? Anyone who'd like to start? Oh, Michael? I, I, I saw the finger pointed to me. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so here's my concept that I would uh, open up with, and that is, one of the things we can do immediately is to understand there is rural culture. 
and I'm going to address it from that perspective. And one of the things that's interesting is I've seen a rural cultural mentality crossing international lines because as we see rural people coming in from Central America and from other parts of the world, there's a link that I can almost always link it up to what I'm seeing in rural Alabama. And your biggest piece in, as far as stigma is to understand that rural culture is very independent. Uh, people do not want to talk about their private lives. They don't want to share their health care issues. And when you overlay that with the whole concept of if they're dealing with gender identity or sexual identity, if they're dealing with poverty, a history of, of racial inequality, and just rural inequality, I can throw at you very clearly, you're going to see health disparities in every rural community always be worse than in urban centers. Now, that's just truth, and I can back it up. So as you pull all that in, to understand that when you start addressing, and in our case in Alabama and South Carolina and other places, how we are going to address the stigma issue, we address it first there. And then we go into like what is going to work in that community. And one of the things we're excited about is the perspective that one size does not fit all. And as long as we understand that, we can then go out and say, okay, this program worked well in Chicago inner city but it may not translate as is in an African-American or uh, black community in rural Wilcox County, Alabama. Even though they share a lot of similarities, it's a different culture. So we must adapt it. And so I think starting there and go to the people in your community. Find out from them. Tell me what is the issue. How can we make this better for you? In our case, we do telemed for that reason. But to get into that first part, understand your community, listen to them, and then address your answer to them. Thank you. And so part of that mentioning telemed, it's a way of acknowledging stigma and yet still meeting people who are experiencing it, right? Acknowledging we might not be able to eliminate it, but we can reach people. And I know, Phyllis, you mentioned um, in your interview that at your clinic, since it is a broad FQHC, folks can come and not feel like they're coming to an HIV-specific site. Can you talk about how that's helpful for your patients? It's very helpful. Patients come in, they're sitting in the waiting room, you don't know what they're there for. At our center, we serve a multitude of services to include the mental health, substance abuse, case management. We have it all. So they feel like they can get everything in one-stop shop. And we also have the dental services. So some of our patients explain that it's such a hard time for them to go to some other dentist because they don't want to treat them because they're HIV positive. At our clinic, we don't look at the diagnosis. We treat you as you. We treat you as family. And that's the best way to go. And our patients consider us to be family because many times the family um, ostracizes them and they just don't want to have anything else to do with them. So we just jump in and do what we have to do. You know, I, I think one of the remarkable things is the fact that we're still talking about HIV stigma within the fourth decade of the HIV epidemic. Um, I remember at the very beginning of the epidemic growing up in New York City um, and watching you know, cohorts of gay men literally disappearing before my eyes um, and all of the stigma that was taking place there. Um, but it was really frightening just to see a couple of years ago um, when Charlie Sheen came out as HIV positive and all of a sudden you saw all of the dailies and reporters asking about whether or not he infected any of his partners. That's exactly where everybody went to was, you know, you are somehow a disease, a vector of disease, um, and you are a threat to the rest of the community. Um, and it's also sad, too, that just this past weekend, you know, Jonathan Van Dam just came out about his HIV-positive status and how difficult a decision it was for, you know, somebody who is a well-resourced, well-respected television personality to talk about something that really shouldn't be a big issue, particularly in the age of you equals you. And I think where some of these intersecting identities and stigmas really come into play is what that really means for people living with HIV on a day-to-day -day basis when you have some of this compounded stigma. Uh, there's a really great research that's been done at University of Alabama um, by Michael Mogavero, who looked at the degree to which people have adverse events in their lives. If they have multiple adverse events within the past six months, how that affects whether or not they take their medications and if they're virally suppressed. And, not surprisingly, individuals who had multiple adverse events within the past six months 
were far less likely to take their medications, they're far less likely to be virally suppressed. So it's clear that there's a very strong relationship uh, between this persistence of stigma that we have around HIV as well as all these other multiple uh, um, um, individuals and phobias um, that intersect with people's lives as well as their health status. I would just also add from the local health department perspective, thinking about how we are also looking within our agencies and within our programs about how um, stigma may be perpetuated. So there is the outward programming doing to reduce stigma, but then also looking within and um, having health departments and other local agencies and communities take on anti-racism training and really developing the workforce and and the, the health department clinics, the STI clinics, to be places that are welcoming, opening, culturally competent uh, for the individuals we are seeking to serve. So speaking of adverse events and poverty, I know when we're talking about childhood adverse events is one of the key ones and also associated with many others. Um, almost every jurisdiction for this report spoke about how poverty affects their patients' lives and their patients' ability to access care if they even you know, get tested in the first place across r rural and urban and suburban jurisdictions. It was a really common theme. What do you all see as some of the ways that policymakers should think about meaningfully addressing poverty? So not just sort of shrugging and saying, well, we know this is a challenge, which we've been saying, you know, as you know, essentially for four decades of the epidemic at this point, but what could really be done to further address the ways in which poverty and unmet social needs are hurting people with HIV or at risk of HIV? I'll start again on that one, uh, being from Alabama. Uh, I'll be honest, I think we have to address it at the state level. I think as much as the federal government has tried to help and encourages, our, our real issues are related to the state and to our infrastructure within a state and our legislature in the state. Mm -hmm. It is a very, I'm in Montgomery, and as much as we try to educate a lot of our folks there, it still sometimes isn't caught on. I don't think that it's a history, it's a, a, a mindset that goes back hundreds of years, uh, so it's not going to be easy for people who are from the south or in more rural states, you know what I'm talking about, but it's just, that's the beginnings. But we have to show them on two levels, one, how it is impacting their people and their constituents, uh, but also I always bring in the economic devastation that it brings. A state is never going to grow, and they always want business growth, but it's not going to if you don't have a well-educated, healthy population. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think we have to do it, in especially southern states, is address our legislature. Mm -hmm. And Gretchen, uh, you know, you work across a, a range of health issues as well, and with local <coughs> health departments, poverty obviously is an issue for many other areas of health and health risk as well. Are there any particular approaches that you've seen states and localities take to really address those, those unmet social needs for people, whether in the HIV context or elsewhere? Yeah, I think you bring up an important point, Naomi, to say that um, this is beyond just the HIV context, and I think local health departments are very well situated to address HIV within the broader context of health for their communities and taking on those issues of poverty. You know, local health departments are participating in efforts to assess their community health needs and develop community health improvement plans, and I think across the board we see poverty as a critical issue and how that is being addressed and the role of local health departments in really working with community partners and at the state level as well to think about what are those social determinants of health, what is the role of public health and local health departments in addressing housing, in addressing education, in addressing food insecurity. And so as it relates specifically to the HIV context, I think tapping into those broader efforts that are being led across jurisdictions and leveraging that for the work that we are looking to do within HIV. Mm -hmm. One, um idea that came up in multiple interviews for the project was that the Ryan White program is, you know, empowered and, and to some extent funded mm -hmm. to address some of those social needs, but of course only for people already living with HIV, right? So for folks who are at risk of HIV, you, there isn't the same well-funded mechanism to address those, those unmet transportation, housing, et cetera, that may drive risk, um, but that you can't 
help meet for someone until they're living with HIV. So speaking of prevention, speaking of better meeting the needs of people who may be at risk, let's talk about PrEP a little bit. So in the report, going to, to John's question, you know, the report discusses, while we did not delve into intellectual property law, we did discuss cost and concerns about cost both at the patient level and the system level, as well as many other barriers to PrEP, right? So as Dr. Beckham discussed, you know, knowledge among providers, among patients, stigma related to not just HIV, but related specifically to PrEP, and a number of other barriers that have led to not only this, you know, 80% of people who are candidates for PrEP aren't using it, but a huge racial slant, right? And so that people who are using PrEP are far more likely to be white, to be privately insured, to be upper class than the average among people who are at risk um, of HIV. So I wanted to hear from you all, um, again, concretely, what you think we need to do to push that. We've seen an increase in PrEP, you know, since FDA approved Truvada for PrEP in 2012, but I, I don't want to say without a chart in front of me whether we've plateaued, we certainly haven't scaled up all the way. So what are some of your perspectives on what concretely, again, states, providers, you know, Phyllis, if you want to give the provider perspective, need to be doing better? I just think more programs need to be created um, to help those, to make it more accessible to individuals who are not HIV positive. Mm -hmm. um, there are not enough programs to assist. As you said, those with insurance can get assistance. Those without, some of the pharmaceuticals will help to assist. But there are some that's not even aware. Without the education, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. So we just have to educate. The biggest is to educate them. Mm -hmm. And to have maybe groups where you talk about PrEP and talk about the different side effects, what it may do for you, what it, you just want to prevent the, the transmission of HIV. Mm -hmm. It's the biggest of what we're trying to do with PrEP. Mm -hmm. And many people would like to have PrEP. They come in, they have the conversation, but they're stopped when the funds are not available for mm -hmm. them to access the funds. And we kind of jump through hoops to try to make that happen for them. And in many cases, the majority of the time, we make it happen. And to Anne's earlier question um, about women, women came up a lot in the PrEP discussions, a lot of places frankly saying we don't reach women as much as we'd like to, as much as we need to. Women don't perceive themselves to be potential PrEP users. Is that something you see in your practice or, Michael, that you see um, with the, the folks you serve? I see more women. More, um, men than I do women coming in for prep. So, yeah. And, and for us, we, we're kind of unique because uh, we use telemedicine, direct practice telemedicine throughout our region. That's been a real help for us because we cover a massive area. Our area uh, sometimes are the size of two or, two or three New England states. I mean, we're, we're huge. And very rural, very bad transportation structures on non-existence. But we're unique because of two things. One, uh, we serve right now about 40% of our recipients of care are women. So to answer, yes, there is absolutely care for women going on. Uh, and in fact, uh, our women are an important part of our outreach program anyway. But out of that, we're also about 40% women on PrEP program, which is unique. But that's a lot because we target making sure that our women as well as our men are being educated on it. We're also unique that a little over half of the people that we serve on our PrEP program are, are identifying as African American or black. Uh, we've had organizations that were 100% uh, African American organizations say they struggle with that. We've just put together a great group of people, you know, who care about the folks they're serving. And we use the technology now because we're about to ramp up a program with the Alabama <laughs> Department of Public Health to where we're going to provide PrEP through their health department sites to help cover the state. Uh, we're ourselves in another program out of Tuscaloosa, Alabama, <laughs> Roll Tide, uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, uh, called Five Horizons, and we're initiating the first step of that project. And that goes back to collaboration as a key. The more and more we work together, get out of silos and work together. And if you're from a poor area, you're used to that. You don't have the luxury of picking and choosing who you want to serve. You serve everyone, and I know you as well. You welcome all who come in and make sure that you give quality care. So I think that's where we are, and we've had some success with it, certainly. And again, I give credit to the people who are working on that project.
So Gretchen, your perspective on the role of local health departments with PrEP. Yeah, we often think of local health departments as building the infrastructure for PrEP. And so a couple years ago in 2015, we did a national survey of local health department to assess their engagement in PrEP implementation. Um, at that time in 2015, we found that just shy of 30% of local health departments were engaged in PrEP implementation. But for those that, that were currently engaged in PrEP implementation, they were doing that work to build the infrastructure. So to develop the provider capacity in their jurisdictions, identifying providers to prescribe PrEP, establishing systems to link and, and connect individuals to PrEP, and then also generating the demand for PrEP among the populations that would most benefit. Um, and when we asked what, you know, what are you most doing and what is your optimal role, both for local health departments that were currently engaged in PrEP implementation as well as those who weren't, referring high-risk individuals to PrEP was identified as the most optimal role or the most common way the local health departments were engaged. And I think that's really where, you know, Naomi, to get to a point that you brought up earlier about the Ryan White care system and the types of services that are provided for individuals who are positive, um, while we don't have a comparable system for those who are negative and uh, who who are on PrEP or interested in getting on PrEP, um, the role of PrEP navigators and their capacity to support um, the identification of providers, uh, you know, navigating a complex healthcare system of where insurance access and payment for the medication, um, as well as some of the support services, including adherence counseling that go into it. I think that uh, local health departments, particularly those that are providing clinical services and operating STI clinics, those are key places to identify individuals who are at high risk for HIV and would benefit from PrEP um, and being able to have the support in, in a PrEP navigator and, and thinking about how this new funding and existing funding can be utilized to build up that workforce capacity. Great. Thank you. Oh. So I think in some ways, too, that um, we, we have to realize that we have to learn from the past. In many ways, past is prologue here. Um, when ARTs were introduced back in 1996, we saw immediately afterwards that disparities between blacks and whites in terms of mortality for HIV just skyrocketed. And that was because African Americans were less likely to have access to ART compared to whites because they're less likely to have access to health care. Um, we're seeing the same thing now with PrEP. Um, and the sad thing is we didn't learn from what took place back in 1996. So now when there's a new health innovation, the communities that are most marginalized are less likely to have access to that health innovation. So what is probably going to take place now is you know, pretty much up in the air. Either we're going to come to a point where some of the disparities at some point are going to lessen, like they did from 1996 to now in terms of between blacks and whites um, and mortality, um, or they're going to remain the same or magnify. Um, but there's certainly you know, quite a few things that we need to do to make sure that we reduce those disparities. And whenever there are any other further innovations that come down the road, we're talking about long-acting injectables and others, that we're ready. Um, and we're ready to make sure that those communities at highest risk will have access to those so that we don't have these disparities that we're seeing now um, in terms of PrEP access um, by race, by gender, et cetera, that we actually are really thinking ahead to make sure that those communities have access to it. That's a really interesting point, particularly because I would imagine that the Ryan White program is responsible for much of that decline and disparity that eventually occurred after 1996. So thinking about that analogy is useful. Um, continuing to speak about disparities, folks today, m almost everyone we spoke with for the report, talked about the burden of HIV borne by young MSM, young MSM of color in particular, um, the just extraordinarily high um, levels of risk and the burden experienced and lower access to care. Uh, wanted each of you all to speak a bit about what you've seen as far as, again, from the provider perspective. Um, you know, we had one provider say, we don't see a lot of young MSM of color come in for PrEP, and then we do see a lot of them come in for treatment, right? Which is exactly you know, what everyone's describing here. We're not getting them at the prevention side. We're not reaching people we need to. Then they come in when they, when they zero convert. So if you all could talk a little bit again concretely, um, you know, we've all kind of come to an agreement and an understanding that this is a problem, that this is a, a population that needs to be better served. What needs to be done by providers and by policymakers? More education. We've got to educate them, um, put up posters, flyers, whatever, but we got to educate them. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest of it, trying to pull them in, mm -hmm. um, explaining to them what can happen. You know, it's kind of like a birth control pill. If you take it, it, it can prevent. 
It's not guaranteed, but it can prevent. Education. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts, Michael? You know, so your... from our perspective, uh, again, because of the culture, the rural culture that we deal with, what could work well in, in, in Midtown Atlanta with a huge billboard that tells you exactly where you can go to be able to get these services, et cetera, do not necessarily translate to rural communities because at that point no one's going to go to that spot because then they're going to be identified, mm -hmm. if you know what I'm saying. So that's what we had to develop, and we've had success with it. If, again, if you notice with our PrEP program, again, we are over uh, slightly over half of our uh, PrEP recipients are African-American or identify as black. <laughs> Many of those are young MSM, young gay MSM, and here's how it happens. It begins what you learn to use in any rural community, but also in neighborhoods, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. Someone says, they're all right, go over to them. So what we've done is establish that networking, which I personally believe that whole, the peer uh, navigation piece, brilliant. That could work so far beyond what people think. And we need to make sure certainly that the, the peer slash consumer, how, whatever term wants to be used, but these are just people in that community who know. Make sure that we compensate them for that work, but also understand the strengths they're bringing to that table. Word of mouth in small towns and rural, but even in urban centers, that's where it goes. A lot of trans women and trans men, they've learned the service delivery structure by word of mouth. There's no real network, it's word of mouth, and that's how it developed. So I think that, to me, is the solution to bring that model into play. And then for your people who are in those agencies, welcome them, welcome them, welcome them. Make sure that you are welcoming the people coming in. Make sure your staffers are very diverse, that they reflect, but more importantly, that someone sees somebody they can connect with, and that's also a big deal. It may not be one who one would think, like we had a, a heterosexual African-American woman who these Caucasian gay men tend to flock to her. They loved her. So, you know, and it could be totally opposite, but make sure all your people, you are that diverse, but also that they all welcome everybody coming in the door. I agree with that. Um, even when you talk about Chicago and the big billboards, one side does not fit all, and you have to figure out what's going to work best for you and your community. Mm -hmm. Agree? Okay. But I think there's certain things that we also have to do within the healthcare environment and the healthcare settings. Um, I mean, you know, CDC data are fairly clear that, um, you know, young black gay men and, um, uh, you know, knowledge of PrEP is, is fairly high. Um, what's happening is that people aren't able to access it um, because of access to healthcare. Um, and then the other problems that we have is that you're seeing a lot of these young black gay men who are accessing PrEP, um, but then the discontinuation rates are extremely high. And that's where we see a lot of the serial conversions taking place is when all of a sudden, you know, a life event might happen. They um, might lose access to health care because they no longer have a job or uh, there's been some other disruption that's taking place in their lives. And, and I think that's the part that we also have to concentrate on. It's not just getting the men onto PrEP. Um, it's also really just trying to make sure that we have a bridge that's available um, once there's some sort of disruption that takes place in their lives. And CDC even just came out with um, an MMWR just this past Friday to try and explain why we're seeing um, young black gay men less likely to access PrEP. And what they found is that even though providers are speaking to young black gay men as well as young white gay men about PrEP, that young white gay men are more likely to be offered PrEP from providers. Um, and they saw this in various jurisdictions that they published within the MMWR. So there's a lot of work that we have to do even among providers uh, to educate them about PrEP and individuals who might be at risk who can really benefit from that type of intervention. Um, you know, the disparities are, are not necessarily only about whether or not um, what these communities know or don't know. Um, the disparities that we're seeing, a lot of it is really due to the differences in the types of health care that's being offered to some of these populations. Yeah, for, for local health departments, I mean, I think to pick up on something that Michael is talking about, thinking about the the environment and who is doing the work, um, that's really, that's absolutely critical. And there's a lot of 
innovation and strong community education and outreach that we can see local health departments leading um, and but you know also really critically thinking about other partners at the community and local level for relationship building those that might be more directly reaching and representing young black gay men and really thinking innovatively uh, to what what do those partnerships look like how can we establish systems of care and social support services working with community partners, community members to really drive and inform what, what these systems look like and then taking the lead from them to, to build them. So to raise another issue where I know local health departments have been both scrambling and working creatively um, to try to to try to respond, um, the the report talks about the intersection of the opioid epidemic and broader substance use issues within America with HIV. And as you all know, um, you know we saw very high rates of infection among people who inject drugs early in the epi in the epidemic. That was turned around in many ways, but we're now seeing a bit of an increase again, mostly linked to people um, using injection opioids, although not exclusively. We're seeing rural outbreaks. So Scott County, Indiana, is one of the jurisdictions profiled in the report. They had a proportionate to their uh, population enormous <laughs> outbreak in 2015 linked to um, injection drug use. Um, we're seeing a similar pattern happening now in West Virginia. And in fact, CDC has identified, I think, hundreds of counties with similar kind of risk profiles that are poised to potentially have either an HIV outbreak or an HCV, hepatitis C outbreak, or, or both. Um, wanted to know if you all could talk a little about how do we how do we prevent? <laughs> We're at a point now where you know this could explode in a lot of places, or we could try to use the tools we have to keep that from happening. What are your thoughts about what we need to do now? Do you want to? Mike, Michael's our, our starter. Yeah, <laughs> I just, yeah, I keep that. So I, I was actually uh, I was at a, a meeting this past week, and this wonderful lady who. Uh, has been uh, in recovery for 20 plus years was just, she made a, a joke which was so ironic. Alabama is probably maybe second, third. I think Tennessee has the most prescriptions written for opioids. Alabama was like right in the top five. What I laughed about, she says, you know what that means is for a state of about five million, almost a little over five million, there were six prescriptions written for opioids uh, in our state. And she said, I'm mad because somebody's got all six of mine because I've not used it. And I thought about it. No, I never have either. What that was saying, though, was that we are in a state in the you know rural state in the Bible Belt of America where we are getting prescriptions written like in mass for uh, opioids. And then in turn, they're being shut down which then obviously means we get the wonderful visit from our heroin dealers who are beginning to come in and they're targeting rural. But I see another piece, and that is in our rural areas in the southern part of the state, crystal meth is making a comeback with a vengeance. And I've talked more and more with rural providers of care who are saying the same thing. The little trailers, and I can say that because that's my culture, trailers out there and we're all down the dirt road. All of a sudden I know when it started because I still live in rural Alabama. And all of a sudden I'll see cars from Texas and Georgia and others coming down a dirt road in central Alabama. I'm like, what? Where are these people going? Well, they're going to pick up at the trailer park that's down on that park. That leads to the culture of that issue is that whether it's opioid or crystal meth or others, the drug-driven issues are there. And then all of a sudden you have survival sex going on. You have certainly no protection. People are shooting up far more. And so I think that intersection is very clearly written into that point. And we've had to expand our behavioral health programming and our addictions programming for that very reason because of the folks that are coming in. And you have to realize we are seeing about 20 to 25, sometimes 30 new cases a month coming into our clinic. Some of them are returned to care, like they got out of care 12 years back or 15, but most are, are new cases, many of them younger, but we also have our 70 and 80 year olds coming in who have been positive for a long time. So I think all of that pulling into play, that intersectionality is so real. And when you're talking about from an HIV standpoint, case managers are invaluable. And I, I agree with you too on the prep, navigators have got to be a part of that. If we don't, we're gonna lose people out of that. And Greg, I know that at AMFAR, you've done a lot of work on the intersection of HIV with both the, you know, the, the sort of new opioid epidemic, but also you know, folks particularly in urban areas, heroin's been around a long time. This isn't new for a lot of populations. So what are some of the key recommendations you would make coming from that research? <laughs> 
Well, I, I think the, the first thing that, that we really need to do is we, we have to commend to HHS for not only this plan, um, but for having common sense public health interventions to address um, many of these issues, particularly the opioid crisis. The scale up of syringe services programs in and of themselves um, is something that's going to be incredibly helpful. There's about 334 certain services programs nationally in the U.S. Um, it took us quite a while to scale up some of those because um, there are particular states that were phil philosophically against having a certain services program. That changed after Scott County. Many of the states that bordered around Scott County all of a sudden got religion and they, scaled, they started to scale up SSPs, which is terrific. And that's, that's exactly what we need to help. And it's good to see that HHS is moving forward that, with that work as well. Why that's also important is that in Scott County, we had nearly 200 people um, become infected with HIV, uh, which is remarkable for a county of only 20,000 people. Um, I used to work at CDC, would go on disease investigations. I know exactly what took place with Scott County and, and some of the work that CDC and local health officials did. But why that's important is because in all of the disease investigations I'd been in at CDC, I'd never seen any outbreaks that were more than just 50 people. But to have 200 people was just it's something that was unheard of. Um, and what also makes it um, particularly important is that there is no SSP in Scott County. There is no syringe services program. And to sort of bring the point home in New York City, where I'm from originally, you know, New York has tens of millions of people um, who are there. Within the same year of Scott County, there were fewer infections among people who inject drugs in New York City as compared to just the 20,000 in Scott County. And that's because we didn't have a common sense um, prevention programs such as SSPs within place. And I'm thankful that um, HHS is really moving forward with plans to scale up SSPs in many places across the United States to really try and get ahead of the curb and reduce the number of infections that we might see among people who inject drugs. And we did, for the report, spoke with a health administrator in Scott County now and with the, the one HIV provider in, in Scott County. Um, and just they had so many insights and really almost, uh, particularly the, the physician, you know, warnings to other counties saying, look, now we know. We've put these things into place now. And it really was, it was exciting to hear, you know, really, again, robust syringe exchange, for example, stigma reduction programs, et cetera. Um, but really they wanted other counties that might be at risk to, to, to hear that and to read those details. So we, you know, we hope that that is useful in the report as well. Gretchen, speaking of, of local health departments, um, you know, we know that local health departments in general and state health departments are, they're losing budget money every year on the whole. They're losing workforce. They're straining to deal with a whole bunch of existing health problems and to be prepared for potential health problems. Yeah. So how do you see, how can making health departments ready to help end HIV in the U.S also help strengthen them to serve the rest of the roles they need to serve. I think that's a really important framing for this. It's both how does ending the HIV epidemic provide an opportunity to strengthen uh, health departments and local public health infrastructure, but how does strengthening of the local public health infrastructure, the workforce capacity, then support ending the HIV epidemic? And I think we have a great opportunity with new resources available through the Ending the Epidemic initiative to have some of that infusion of resources into these counties, into these states, and that's going to be absolutely critical. And some of those resources will need to go directly into shoring up core public health functions, surveillance functions, and the provision of core services um, to be able to meet the goals of the Ending the HJB Epidemic uh, Initiative. You know, we've seen over the past decade very significant budget cuts and job losses um, across our local public health system. That's certainly been seen at the state level as well, and, and I would say in, in parts of the federal government too. Um, we've had 56,000 jobs lost at the local health department level. That's nearly a quarter of the local health department workforce has been lost over the past decade. And so it's going to take um, significant systems strengthening and investment to 
rehire and, and build up that capacity and modernize some of our systems and infrastructure. You know, surveillance is discussed quite frequently in the report, and I think that is absolutely necessary to highlight when we think about interventions like data to care and how we are going to inform uh, the planning that's going to go into this initiative. You know, we need strong data to be able to do that. We need effective data systems to be able to do that, and individuals, a workforce working at the local level to be able to utilize and apply that data effectively. Great, thank you. So I'm getting the blinking light that indicates we should shift to audience questions. Um, I do wanna, since you mentioned data, take the opportunity just to flag that AMFAR has just put out a resource with a lot of data about HIV in America, but a particular focus on the jurisdictions that the federal strategy is targeting. Um, and I hope one of you will ask Greg to say more about it since I ran out of time. So now we'll go to audience questions and I think we've got the mics coming around again. So if you could raise your hand, they'll come to you. Hi, um, Logan Chase with the State Health Policy Team at Academy Health. I wanted to first off thank the panel. All the information was incredibly insightful. And I know you talked a lot about uh, prep, con prep discontinuation, uh, both in the panel and on the report. I was wondering if you had looked at um, clinical care services and the coverage or lack there of coverage for like STD testing and the lab work that goes with prep usage and as a barrier to continued or initial prep usage. Would anyone like to take that? Gretchen? Oh, maybe Gretchen and then Michael. Yeah. Oh. Uh, I mean, I, I think that that is a, a key place where some of those navigation services come into play. So there is, you know, regular maintenance and testing and reasons to come into care or have, have care brought to you versus via telemedicine. Um, and, and so absolutely having, whether it's built in reminders or actual individuals calling up uh, to say, you know, have you come in for your regular test, STD testing um, or when a prescription needs to be refilled. So really building up that structure. I know we've been talking about um, data to care and data for care in the context of HIV care and treatment, but I think also some innovative work is happening around the country to think about how data can be used to flag what um, and, and track PrEP persistence and hopefully support individuals to remain adherent and persistent with their PrEP as long as they are interested in doing so. And we, we make STI a part of the PrEP process. We just blended it together for the reason that many times people were coming in and if we're seeing them you know, with an STI, uh, especially regular basis, we go ahead and talk to them about everything, including the PrEP programming and the HIV program. And that it's actually worked because then they come back. We're getting a lot. That's why our numbers are continuing to grow. Phyllis, you're seeing similar patterns. Yes, we have, and we do the same. We do the same to get them back in. Um, we educate, we, we are text to get you to remind you of appointments to come back. And it's working pretty well. Catherine Connor with the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. Uh, thank you all for all the work you're doing and coming to DC to talk to us. Uh, I'm targeting this question a little bit to Michael, but I want to open up to everyone on the panel. You know, within the report, I think case management's come up quite a bit. And obviously, the case management issues with a pregnant woman and a mother infant pair are pretty unique. And I think the report really um, highlights the fact that you're not just navigating patient needs, but also the different federal eligibility criteria for a mother and an infant at different times. Um, I'm a little more familiar with how urban settings and the major research hospitals deal with these mother-infant pairs and the pregnancy, but I don't know as much about how a rural area would do it, and it struck me when you said you have 40% of the women that you're treating, I mean 40% of your patients are women. I was curious how you in particular or how your area deals with HV-positive pregnancies, but I would open up to everybody on the panel. So for us, we, we work directly with UAB, with Children's Hospital, and we're their provider uh, in the southern part of the state. And we actually have just launched our telemedicine piece to that, and where we beam into our sites within those areas, so it's whatever is the most easy access for the woman to come into. Uh, we also are very targeted, meaning uh, if we have a woman who has been identified, because we, we're still seeing women come in and they didn't know that they were HIV positive. Some don't know, you know, until they came in for delivery because they didn't do any prenatal care. So all of a sudden we're doing a quick turnaround trying to get them in, but they go to the front of the line to get in and get their care addressed. 
Uh, and that's kind of where we've been moving toward that. To statement is case management, uh, and I'm prejudiced because I'm a social worker, I'll go ahead and tell you, but I think social work and case management is an absolute necessity, and that's why the Ryan White Care model is so successful. Uh, and I think if we can make that a part of PrEP and have that piece, it will make all the difference in the world for just as you mentioned, when we lose someone, quote, lose someone, we know somebody's there like, so hey, wh where were you? You're supposed to be in, it's time again. And if they're saying, well, I'm in a problem, I don't have a house. So here, let me help you out. And that's gonna have to be, and it will follow the success of the Ryan White Care Act. Hey, um, Mahir Khan with the Peace Corps again. First, thank you very much. Um, for Michael, you mentioned, this is not really my question yet, but you mentioned the importance of like peer network and, and linkages to services. That's like all Peace Corps does, so yes, yes. we can talk later, <laughs> honestly. We're right super good at it. Yeah. Um, but my main question is kind of building off of what Dr. Beckham mentioned at the end, um, was that with the mature epidemic, things like housing and transportation, these are public health issues. But that's especially challenging in a rural environment. How do you make that ask um, in a rural environment that's already dealing with so many shortages to resources? Yeah. How do you ask not about a $10 prophylaxis, but a $10 million infrastructure bond? Right. So. No, I, I think you're, it, it, and as I preface when I first said, if you looked at healthcare disparities, meaning mortality, you're always going to see if you are living in a small town or rural community, your risk for death is always going to be higher than you lived even in a, in a city. I mean, and it's because of access to care models. You don't have that access. I always share when my grandmother died, uh, a heart attack in rural Alabama, there was no one nearby to be able to help her out. And so for me, that's the disparity. That's real life disparity that rural people face all the time. It's getting better, but it's still there. I think what you've got to look at when you try to address the rural parts, and, and this is real important when you're trying to address <laughs> HIV. I love the Southern AIDS Coalition, and one of the things that they have always said is you're not going to reach the end of this epidemic unless you go through the South. And that doesn't negate everybody else because it's just as important in any other part of the country. I take it one step further. You're not going to get to the end of the epidemic unless you address rural areas in the South. Because in Alabama, 32% of the people who are living with HIV and the AIDS diagnosis live in Birmingham metro area meaning counties around that. That means 68% of the people living with HIV live in the rest of the state, which is predominantly rural and small town. So when you start going to that part, our biggest issue, especially with those small agencies who are out there doing excellent work, they need a vet better way to get access to that money. So often it is traditionally been a barrier to them because they don't have this massive infrastructure. They don't have a grant writer that's making $100,000. There's nobody on their staff making $100,000. Combined, they don't make $100,000. So for them to get access to reach the community that absolutely they're reaching, they need collaborations, whether that's linking with somebody or just making those, those RFPs easier for them to access. It doesn't discount they still are responsible and they have to be expected to, but let's make that an easier process. And those small community programs will, will give you dividends. They're already bringing dividends in. Craig, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat and try to let this be an opportunity that I was gonna ask you about. So how, how again, your new project and database kind of um, highlights some of those material gaps or social determinants of health by jurisdiction and some of the other policy um, pieces of it and how you anticipate it's being used. Sure, I, I, I'm going to talk about the database in a second. One, one thing I do want to say is that we do want, we sometimes need to get rid of the separation between rural and urban to a certain degree. I used to live in Alabama, um, in Georgia, as well as North Carolina for 17 years for um, school and then grad school um, and, and coming from New York City. And one of the things I kept seeing over and over again was the number of people who would disappear to say San Francisco or New York or Washington DC, they would see or convert with HIV and then would come home to some of these rural areas. So we have to get smarter about some of this. You know, what are some of the ways that we can continue with prevention in many of these different areas, not just in rural areas, but in urban areas, so that we can keep that dynamic from happening uh, for some of these individuals. Uh, in terms of the database, this is why you're going to infomercial mode. Um, uh, it's, you can find it online, it's at ehe.amfar.com. 
ehe.org. That's ehe.amfar.org. Uh, we have infographics, I believe, outside on how you use the database. One of the things that we were really interested in is exactly what Michael was talking about, is that we know that all of these counties um, and locations that are part of the EHE process, they're not starting at the same zero line. Um, there are some people and um, organizations and jurisdictions that are much farther ahead than others. Um, and what we wanted to do was to try and provide a resource that provides context for how this initiative is rolling out in each one of these jurisdictions. So it might be easier in a New York, a San Francisco, a Seattle, um, because of resources, because of the number of clinics that are available, uh, because of a host of other issues. Whereas you can see really clearly in a database that it might be much harder in a rural area because we show distance to an SSP or distance to uh, medication assistance therapy or the number of people, of uh, providers who offer buprenorphine for opioids uh, or the number of providers um, overall for, for <laughs> HIV. So we really wanted to show how the context is different in various areas of the United States, as well as the overlay of policy. Um, what's also going to make it more difficult with rolling out the initiative is that there are some states where we still have exposure laws for criminalization for people living with HIV in the U.S., and that is going to make it much more difficult to really gain the trust of the communities to be a part of the initiative and to get out for HIV testing. Uh, we've already talked about Medicaid expansion. Kaiser, uh, Kaiser Family Foundation has done some really fantastic analyses about Medicaid expansion and how um, it's been responsible for getting more people living with HIV um, insured. Um, and we could clearly see very clearly that um, there's a threefold increase in um, um, uninsured individuals for those states that haven't expanded Medicaid. CDC just did an analysis taking a look at continuous viral suppression. We always talk about viral suppression, but looking at continuous viral suppression, those states that have expanded Medicaid have people who are continuously virally suppressed. So these are many of the contextual issues, even LGBT discrimination um, and other issues that we try to capture as part of the database so that people can see what's taking place in each one of these states, what's taking place in each one of these counties, and to just go ahead and juxtapose that with a lot of the disease prevalence data on STDs, on HIV, as well as hepatitis C. Great. I think we have time for one last very brief question, if anyone has one. If not, thank you so much to the expert panelists here today. Naomi, th thank you. And, and to the panelists again, thank you for that very stimulating, informative uh, discussion. Very, very helpful. And that brings us to the uh, conclusion of our event today. Uh, once again, I hope all of you get a chance to review the report. Again, this is a report from the front lines of the epidemic. You know, we really strove to get out of the beltway uh, and to report on uh, what we heard. Uh, and I think the policy considerations in here, hopefully, that will be helpful to all of your uh, policy work, the views and opinions, uh, all the policy cons considerations are those uh, of the Bipartisan Policy Center and our staff. So I hope you do uh, get a chance to take a look at that. Uh, let me end by providing a couple of, of thank yous um, to, to folks in the room. Uh, first, thank you to the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation as well as Gilead Sciences for their generous support of this project and their role in preventing HIV and improving the lives of Americans with HIV. Thank you. I also want to recognize the team here at BPC, led by Senior Vice President uh, Bill Hoagland, uh, as well as Kate Castling, Morgan Bailey, Tyler Barton, Collier Fernikes, and Joanne Donnellan. Special thanks once again to Dr. Charles Holmes and Naomi Seiler for serving as terrific consultants and subject matter experts on this project. And I want to thank everyone who joined today in person, all of, the, all of those who joined via webcast. Uh, I think uh, we can all agree uh, that it is possible to end the HIV epidemic. It's just going to take all of our collective will uh, to ensure that we can overcome stigma, that we can increase access to, to treatment and care, and that we can address the social determinants of health. So thank you. We look forward to the road ahead and uh, looking forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. <laughs>